with the strike of a light bulb. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tycho. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the papers of paper, hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine cracker stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. All right, welcome back to Developer Commentary. My name's Mike Stout. And I'm Tony Garcia. Don't you mean Tiggity Tony Garcia? <laughs> All right. For those of you that missed the last episode, I'm still mad at him because we're still doing the same recording session. I know that that breaks the fourth wall and shit, but whatever. So, uh, are we doing some more of these arena challenges? I think so. I mean, we got to get that rocket launcher, man. I, I, don't, I don't think I can take being made fun of for the gravity bomb anymore. How many more challenges do we got before we do we get that rock launcher? Well, I gotta win some first, instead of just continuously losing. Uh, but I'm not sure. You know, next time I'm in the thing, I'll check. Alright. All right. We can take yeah, some of the higher... 75,000 bolts is a lot. It's a lot of bolts. We can, uh, we can take some of the higher paying challenges, maybe. So, uh, uh, what, you, what would you like to talk about this time, Tony? Uh, I, I got some stuff, but what, what do you think? Let's hear what you have to say, Mike. In the uh, Reddit thread about uh, the crates, someone mentioned that they were really interested in how we did uh, you know, ammo and uh, health crates. So I thought maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this one's a little bit more your field, though. I mean, I know you had a lot to do with uh, actually coming up with that design doc of where... Uh, what we had to tune and you know what each level had to be a little bit more than me. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, why don't you go ahead and uh, I'll chime in with my witty comments, and wonderful <laughs> observations. That sounds good to me. Um, well, to start with, uh, since we're in an arena, I might as well talk about how we did the delivery for the arena. Okay. Um, so there are two two factors at work in the arena. One is, you know, uh, a designer. And a programmer look at each one of these waves and they say, here are the enemies that spawn. And here, and you know, on wave three, we spawn a health crate. And on wave two, we spawn two ammo crates, right? And uh, pretty much all that we're doing programmatically is trying to figure out how to get them on screen. Because, you know, half the time you're only looking at half these spawners. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, the, other f the other factor besides a designer just saying it goes here is uh, the difficulty tuning system. And the way that worked on this is that uh, there, behind the scenes, there are three invisible difficulty levels that you can be on. Easy, medium, and hard, right? Uh -huh. And the way it figured that out was for every level, we would say, how many times do we think a player should die in this level? And uh, uh, if you died more times than that, it would move you down from medium to easy or from medium to hard, right? Uh -huh. But it would never move you down in that level. It would only move you down in all future levels. You start the game out on normal, and then you die too many times, so it puts you down to easy. Well, the part of the game you're in isn't going to change at all, but later parts of the game will have fewer enemies and fewer crates. And they also do less damage if I remember correctly, right? Uh, right. Uh, although we didn't do that in Ratchet 2, actually. In Ratchet 2, we just changed... Uh, how many enemies there were. Well, this isn't Ratchet 2. Yeah. So in Ratchet 3, we were changing both. And uh, so that basically, mo the easier it was, the more health crates you got. And the harder it was, the fewer health crates you got. And then this whole this whole thing was essentially off in uh, New Game Plus. So whenever you played New Game Plus, you were never getting tuned. Uh, right. And so then in this, it was a factor of... Uh, you know, sort of what difficulty you're on, and then whether a designer said it would be there. And it's, it's similar in other levels, right? So a designer would place a stack of health crates and a stack of ammo crates, and he would flag each one of those as... Aw, I need to pay attention. <laughs> he'd flag a crate as an easy crate, he'd flag a crate as a hard crate, you know, uh, and then those crates would only show up in those difficulty modes. And that's pretty much it. So... Uh, that would determine how many health crates would spawn, and it would also determine how much health you got back from a health crate, I think. Uh, and the way that we hid that was by randomizing it a little bit. Uh, I may be mixing the games up a little bit, uh, and some people who, who've done facts or speedruns might know differently, but that was sort of the general idea of how it worked. Right. 
Then we had another system that had been in place since Ratchet 1 called the ARMS system, which uh, I think we talked about a little bit in Ratchet 2. Um, if anyone wants to look it up, I think it was the, uh, the Space Vegas level where, where we talked about it. But uh -huh. uh, basically, there's a system that keeps track of how much ammo you're using, which gun's your favorite, uh, you know, which gun you're lowest on, and all that stuff. And does a bunch of calculations and figures out how many of which type of ammo it should spit out at you, right? And then in Ratchet 2 and Ratchet 3, those numbers were also uh, tied into the difficulty system. So how much ammo you got and which ammo was a factor of all of that stuff. And I, that's, that's pretty much all I can say about the magic behind health crates. I mean, we, we tried to make sure that we... We would place a bunch of health crates after the, the most difficult setups, right? So you could have a chance to recharge. Uh, uh, and then all that automagic stuff happened as well. Well, there was a lot of other... This isn't directly related to health and ammo crates. But there, in addition to... Uh, in addition to the that part of the difficulty tuning, there was also a, a very complex sort of formula in the background dealing with... Uh, the economy and making sure that each segment uh, gave the correct amount of bolts. Oh yeah, that's, and I don't think totally people was. realize that the bolts that you get out of crates isn't random. No, no. Uh, so we we have to be very particular about making sure that the character that the player is progressing through and getting the amount of bolts that we want them to get at different points in the game. Uh, otherwise, the whole game breaks down because you can't buy weapons, you can't buy ammo. Right, or which uh, another thing which actually is a problem is if you get weapons and ammo too fast because yes. there's like this sweet spot where you're getting them at exactly the right speed where the game feels great and anything that's too easy and anything that's too hard makes it feel crappy. Right, and so if we were to tie the bolts that you got to the crates, it would be too easy for somebody to just go in and be like, Oh, you know what? This place looks a little bit sparse. I'm just going to add, you know, twice as many crates to the area. And now all of a sudden the economy is completely broken on the level. And may people might not realize that, you know, this this place got doubled. Right. So uh, I believe that it was this case. Uh, you didn't let me know if I'm incorrect, but there was just one big Excel file that said, you know, here's how much segment one of level two is supposed to give you. Here's how much segment two of level two is supposed to give you. Right. How many bolts? How many? Yeah. How many bolts are supposed to get? And then when we spawn crates, we just make sure we count the number of crates in the segment, and then we figure out how much they each need to spawn to sort of reach that threshold. And and the only way to really artificially inflate that is with multipliers. The multipliers throw it off a little bit from like the jackpot crates or stuff, but it's not so crazy that we can't really predict it and right. it never really has enough of a factor to really could turn the game one way or the other you know if you're not really abusing the multipliers or abusing them really well well and the game is keeping track of how close you are to what we expect you to have right and so, then oh i didn't know about that and yeah. so it would up so it would up and down to correct it would mainly it would mainly go up to correct uh we didn't want to penalize people for uh, you know, like you, like getting the bolt multipliers and stuff like that. Right. So, but if if you were getting fewer bolts than you should, it would correct a little bit for that, so that uh, you know you 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 didn't get all the bolts in the level. You know, it it would make future levels maybe have a little more. Well, yeah, that was one thing I was about to talk about, and I think this was a system by Peter. It might have been somebody else, but one of the big things that we had to correct for, and you would think you this might be a problem that a lot of people overlook, is that. If you knock an enemy off a ledge and his bolts go away, I mean, most of the time they'll track you up off the ledge, right. track up to you off the ledge. But every now and then, an enemy will fall off the ledge somewhere and the bolt will be gone. Or maybe a player just doesn't see some of the bolts that pop out of the crate and just walks right by them and skips them. Uh, we keep track of all the bolts that the player leaves behind right. in a given segment. And on the next set of crates or whatever, we make up that difference of bolts the player has left behind to catch them back up. Right, yeah. And, uh, and there was a, a complex algorithm that went into uh, how, many, 
how many physical bolt models came out of every crate, and how yeah. uh, and like uh, how that was many a big each deal actually worth. because uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. As we started giving you more and more bolts, uh, we have like you know the fifty the fifty bolt model, and uh, you know it's easy to just be like, oh, this thing is supposed to give fifty one bolts, so I'll drop the fifty bolt and I'll drop the one bolt, and then we're there. But that is actually incredibly unsatisfying. Yeah. To see two bolts pop out of something. Yeah, you want to see a lot of things come out of every crate. Right, and so I'm. But the, pro the same problem is if you break twenty crates all at once, we can't pop out two hundred bolts. Oh, the game would crash. The it game would, just, would crash. Yeah, I mean the frame rate would go down to zero, and then. Eh. So it's this incredibly complex balance of like trying to make sure every kill is satisfying but making sure that we're not spawning so many bolts that we're destroying our frame rate right. on our reward re reward mechanism. It was an amazingly weird thing to, to balance because it's not something you ever think about uh, when you're playing the game at all. No, no like, but you it's never get, so important. Like, very rarely you're going to sit there and play and be like, I felt that the fact that he only dropped three bolts is the problem, right? <laughs> yeah. You'll be like, it's easy to be like, oh, I felt that guy should have dropped, you know, a hundred bolts instead of twenty-five bolts, but you don't think about the actual physical bolt models that come out. If the guy only drops twenty-five bolts, but there's ten models, as opposed to the one hundred bolts, which is the one model, a lot of people would feel like that twenty-five bolt reward is way more satisfying than the hundred bolt reward. It, oh yeah, and de depending on what it even looks like, you know, uh, did you get a screw as opposed to a bolt, you know, or a yeah. nut or whatever. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. No, it's fine. Uh, and there's there's another part of that system, man. I'm, I I uh, I forgot how complicated the crate system was. <laughs> uh, another part of that is uh, gravy bolts, right? Because uh, right. cause we there are some things that could totally break the economy. Like let's say uh, an artist has to make a breakables pass on a level, and they want more things to be breakable because having breakable stuff is just fucking awesome, right? Uh -huh. But the the artist goes in and makes everything in the level breakable. Well, now all of that has to spawn bolts, and we don't want to take that away from the crates because. We're and that does. And the thing is, breakables do not factor into this into this equation that we just talked about at all. Yeah. Because we know that because the only reason the crates are, or we can do this with the crates, is we know what the crate modi is. Exactly. So it's very easy to count them. Yeah. But to count all the breakables, there was no really good system for counting them. So, what, so they were just sort of left out of the system. So what they would do is they would just spam, uh, spam, or sorry, spawn. Uh, okay, they would just spawn a random number of bolts that was too small to impact the economy. It was actually a function called spawn gravy bolts. Yes, and it would just spawn sure between put on every function. Yeah, and basically it would just spawn five or six one bolt bolts, and it still felt super satisfying. Right. Uh, just because sometimes you'd break a ton of the, uh, uh, you'd break a ton of the crates, and the bolts would just be coming out everywhere, and you wouldn't really get that much, but you'd feel really good. Right, and the thing about the 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 breakables was even though the bolts that they spawned were negligible, and for the most part weren't going to make a difference in the long run of you know your progression on the game. The fact is, when they spawn bolts, people are way more prone to break them because they feel like it's giving them a long-term advantage. Yes. Even though the reality of it is that it's not. Because very often in making games, it's more important that the player feel like he's good or feel like he's powerful or feel like he's doing a good job than it is for that to actually be true. Because the game right. is all about how the player feels. Did you fail that somehow? Uh, it was a one-hit kill challenge, and I, I did not successfully do that. Oh, I don't have the disc blade gun. All right. I'm just trying to do all the ones I don't fail at. You know, keep some variety. Yeah, that's probably good. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was cool, talking about crates. Yeah, well, I mean, they, there's the other part of the health crates that... I don't think was addressed. And I don't know if in this game that we have the two different health crates or if that was introduced in the previous game. That was introduced in the previous game, but we do have it in this game. Because, I mean, that was a big deal in and of itself that 
we went for a long time with only having the one health crate. Right, they gave you five health or whatever. They gave you five health. And as we started upgrading the player's hit points, I think it goes up to 100 in this game. Uh, I forget, uh, yeah. But it, it goes up to a big number, yeah. We realized how woefully insufficient it was to have the one five-point health crate. Yeah, we would have to stack just a ton of health crates up, you know, or, or make them bigger than we wanted to make them. But finding that point where the old crates would start to phase out and the new crates would start to phase in was actually a bit of a challenge because if you start giving out the awesome health crates a little bit too early, they're super overpowered. Right. But if you start giving them out a little bit too late, then all of a sudden they're insufficient. And uh, since they're just placed in the level, like there was still a little bit of a balancing act of like you know slowly phasing them in and where they where they actually work to fit in, and that kind of stuff. And it was pretty it was pretty interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> because I think once we start giving the twenty point or whatever health crates, the five point ones pretty much go away. Yeah, I mean we don't really need them anymore at that point. Right, but I mean the difference is like at this point, one health crate gives you ten percent of your life. Whereas, you know, if the 20 point health grade started coming in when you had 80 hit points, now they're giving you 25% of your life. Right. And it's a completely different sort of balancing act as to how those crates need to be placed throughout the levels as opposed to the, you know, the little five point health grades because they're such a much larger percentage of your total life that we have to put them out a little bit more sparingly. Yep. It's an interesting balancing act, trying to figure out exactly what goes where and and finding a way that doesn't feel cheap. A lot more work goes, a lot more work and thought goes into it than you would expect, for sure. Yep, and uh, it, you know, now that I think of it, it's kind of weird that we made the health crates so consistent like that. I mean, I don't think a lot of games do that nowadays. Uh, like, why did we feel that we couldn't just say, "Oh, the health crate gives you back twenty five percent of your life"? Uh, why, why was it so important that you knew? How many hit points each crate got you back? Um, I wasn't involved in those conversations, so I couldn't tell you. Oh, I, I have no idea either. I'm just sort of... Uh, I mean, I suppose we could try to theorize it, and I think... Uh, it could be because it's old school. It is a bit old school, and there's a lot of old school stuff in, the, in Ratchet, for sure. Just stuff that we didn't question because it had always been done a certain way. But, I mean, I don't know. I think there's definitely an advantage that comes to knowing exactly how much health you're going to get from a health crate. Well, you would know, like, if a health crate gave you back 25%, you'd know how much that bar went back, right? Yes and no. I mean, I think you would know intellectually. I don't think you could just oh, look at your health crate you know. and know, you know, figure it out. Oh, I know how much, how many health crates I need to, you know, you know that's what I'm saying? You know what it probably was? It was probably that we had such a hard time making you feel like when you were gaining levels that, and gaining health points that it mattered. So oh. having the health crates, which is a thing you integrate with all the time, give you a specific amount probably meant that, you know, players would be like, oh man, I've got three health crates now and I'm still at low health. I must have gotten a ton when I'm leveling up. I'll bet you that was what it was. It's entirely possible. Because we really did have a hard time adding the RPG elements to this game. Uh, it just, By hard time, do you mean that people just weren't getting the fact that they were getting more powerful? Yeah, I mean, when, with people? when you'd ask them afterwards, you know, uh, do you feel like every level is satisfying? You know, uh, they wouldn't know how to answer that because they didn't know on a level by level basis, uh, you know, experience level, how how much better they were getting. So getting people to feel like every Every reward that you were getting was really important, was really important. Right. Well, I remember there was a couple play tests that we went through that didn't have the uh, the crazy, insane level-up effect. Right, yeah. And when the crazy, insane level-up effect went in, <laughs> like, everything was instantly different. Oh, and instantly like, better. For the weapons and for, all, and for the player and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that, that sequence is amazingly important. Well, it's 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 like it's a little bit overkill, I think, because it has the insane effect. The whole screen flashes, 
and then just for good measure, we kill everything on the screen. <laughs> right? So those level ups, a lot of the times, end up not only being like, you just got more powerful, but they just saved your axe. Yeah. Like, it's not enough that it it fills your health, which is a, a, enough for most games, to just be in the middle of a fight, and now all of a sudden your health is full. Then you're kind of like, oh man, that level up totally saved my ass in that fight. But the fact that it'll clear the screen for you. Oh yeah, you come back and level. there's electricity and everything dies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was really cool when that went in. I mean, but that was a big part of turns making people feel like these level ups are meaningful, and uh, that's the thing to just to just you know increment that number on the health bar. That's not meaningful, and that's not enough to convey to players that they just did something important and they did something valuable. And that's, that's why uh, in this game, instead of just having, uh, well, in Ratchet 1 also, instead of just having a bar that represents your health, it was important that we had numbers there. Uh, that was a very uh, deliberate decision on our part because we needed you to see those numbers getting bigger. Because otherwise, how would you know that you were healthier than you were before? Right. Especially if the enemies are also getting harder. Uh, we had that problem at the end of Spyborgs, uh, remember? Like, uh, we had to make the initial health bar look really, really short and tiny. Yeah. Because we were just using a bar and we had upgrades. Uh, I wish we'd remembered that. <laughs> oh, man. That's all I got on that. You're really just struggling to not use that gravity bomb. I'm trying so hard, dude. We're we're get, we're close though. We only need about twenty thousand more. That means like six challenges the way you're done. Shut up. But yeah, there's a lot, a lot that goes into crates, and I don't think people realize how the, how important it is to make sure the like core ratchet gameplay. I mean, really, is breaking those crates <laughs> and Everything getting those bolts. Else, Everything about Ratchet, everything else about Ratchet is gravy compared to running around hitting those crates and collecting his bolts. It's all just a means to an end. Oh, you're not, good at, you're not good at that at all. And you know what? I don't even think I realized how important the bolts were until we had this conversation. And I don't think I really realized how interesting the crates were until, you know we found out that a lot of people were interested in it. I just remember, I remember uh, when we were doing the New Game Plus, uh, how insane the bolt multipliers got. Uh, oh, man. And that's, when, and that's when we started to be like, okay, uh, we definitely need some new bolt models because this shit is getting out of hand. Yeah, there's just too many things on screen <laughs> for us to do. And then, the, then you have to have that meeting, and that's always such a weird meeting of like, trying to decide what the new bolt models are going to be because <laughs> everyone has to uh sign off on it because it's the thing you see more than anything else in the game yeah and uh you remember there was a big controversy going from ratchet one to ratchet two because in ratchet one the bolts that fell on the floor were silver and the the ones that were hidden were gold right right then in this game because we realized how much more important the regular bolts were they're gold, and the ones that you pick up are silver. <laughs> yeah. I mean, technically platinum. We tried to make them sound valuable, but... Uh, yeah, it's... It's just a little thing that we figured out. But yeah, I think... the To talk a little bit more about... We, we alluded to the New Game Plus in our very special secret episode. Yes. But uh, to talk about it uh, in a little bit more in depth... Uh, that I don't know whose idea it was to do the bolt multiplier kill streak thing. Oh yeah, but that was but that the was best. brilliant. It oh, was the man. most brilliant thing I could have you could possibly have put. That was ingenious. Uh, I have and no I idea. wish I could remember whose idea it was did, because did it happen it in Ratchet? Good. Did it happen in Ratchet Two? I don't. <sighs> yes, because I remember doing it on the on the level zero spaceship. Got it. Because uh, it might have been Sean's suggestion as a tester. Uh, I know he did the replay plan for this game, so the, the replay stuff in this one is all Sean. Sean uh, Whistler. We're so close, dude. Uh, just a little bit more. All right, if I can beat Scorpio before he falls asleep, then we're good. 
All right, guys, I'm gonna use the gravity bomb. We gotta beat Scorpio. But yeah, I mean that—that that is clearly the best possible thing that we could have done to make Ratchet more satisfying. Is to just have these insane bolt, uh, these insane bolt prizes come out of enemies, and and, and random geometry. Here's another little thing uh, that I think might be people might. Uh, did you get enough? I think you're a little short. I'm oh, good. No, that's enough. You just got it. All right. So this is just another quick thing that was a huge deal in terms of making collecting bolts feel satisfying that I think might be overlooked by a lot of people. That when you collect bolts, your the little bolt counter appears underneath the big bolt you rock. <laughs> it tells you how many bolts you've just collected off of the enemy or this set of crates or whatever. I know what and, story you're telling, yeah. And even that's not enough because when that thing just disappears... Everybody's like, we're just having all my bolts. You, we have that little really racing quick tick down when it actually it goes into your inventory. Right. Or whatever. And that is so essential oh, yeah, to make just... people realize that those two numbers are connected. And the think just putting them next to each other would be enough. But that's not enough. Uh, and the speed at which it happened, like it got tweaked a ton of times. Yeah. I, like, you would think that people would instantly realize, I pick up bolts, that number goes up, they're connected. But that's not how it works out at all. Like, unless you really spell it out to have that number go down while the other number goes up, people aren't registering that that was the number I just got off of that enemy, and now it's going into my inventory. It's so bizarre that, that you have to really spell that out for people. But it was... It was essential, and it was a big problem. I Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, little things make a big difference, you know? Well, especially when it comes to the UI. And again, we're all, we, we keep dancing around the UI thing, but God, I do not envy UI people at all. UI designers, UI programmers, I do not envy their job. Because you would think it would be pretty simple, but it's, it's, it's the most difficult thing. And the most, the most most important thing too, and the most unappreciated thing. <laughs> that and it's audio. Like, it's a it's like a triple whammy. Uh, you know the that and audio tend to be the most uh, underappreciated. Yeah. I, I I knew a sound guy who once said audio video is fifty percent of the audio or video. Uh, audio is fifty percent of the audio video experience, right? Uh, right. But, you know, people just sort of don't really care about it that much. Well, it's. I think it's... This is a weird sort of sidetrack about... I think... I'm going to say this is how games are made everywhere, even though I can't really back that up. But it's been the case everywhere that I've ever worked. All right. And that nobody who develops a game, except for the sound people, play the game with sound on. Because it's incredibly annoying to play the game with sound on. Am I wrong? Well, everywhere you worked, I imagine this is the same way. Yes, but it's just because you're playing it over and over and over and over again. And it's not, but it's not even just that. It's everybody is sitting really close together, and the one person who's testing sound for the day is the most hated person in the office. Because they have to turn the volume up to hear what they're going to do, and it just echoes throughout the entire building. That you know, they're, the sound, ex- the explosions are going off, and they're making sure that things are playing, and they're replaying it over and over to make sure the sound is playing right. And they're probably on the shittiest television, so they don't have headphones. Right, exactly. It's, it's just a courtesy to everybody around you to not play with sound on. Because you're distracting everybody, but because nobody is playing with sound on, not ever you're not there every day, finding it, listening to what's wrong with the audio of the game. Yeah, and and uh, it's a really broken problem. But I'm not about to start testing with my sound on. Well, and there's a, there's a lot of people who will say this this isn't fun, and it's because they didn't hear some of the audio that was going along with it. Right. So it creates some problems that don't actually exist. 
certainly anyone who is uh, evaluating the game to see whether or not it's good should be playing with the sound on, but they don't always. I will say that at Insomniac, I think the person who invariably played with the sound up the loudest was Ted. That's true. You went anywhere near Ted's office when he was playing the game, and it would be blaring. Even his music was incredibly loud. And that was uh, that was because Ted's job was evaluating the game to see if it was fun or not, and yeah. trying to figure out how to fix it. So that's good, right? It is good. But nobody I mean, else was doing it. <laughs> Except him and the sound guys. Uh, and I think we're done for this episode. I don't know how much more arena stuff we can do, Mike. I think it's <laughs> I, time to cut it down. And I think we've run out of things to talk about regarding crates. Uh, well, we've got our rocket launcher, which means you probably won't get teased anymore on the internet. Uh, I'll probably still use the gravity bomb all over the place, but whatever. Well, okay. Well, now they have a legitimate reason to Yes, I will deserve it now. If you're using the gravity bomb over the rocket launcher, there's problems. But I think it's time to cut this one off, and then we'll head off to the next level. So for Ratchet and Clank, up your awesome developer commentary, I am Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And we will see you next time. What, what, what? <laughs>